In this clip, we'll discuss a few of the traditional software design and development processes such as the waterfall model and unified process. Most companies nowadays use some kind of agile process. I'll touch briefly on agile in this clip, but there's a separate video focused on agile processes. A general question we can ask ourselves is, how do you manage the process of constructing complex software? In other fields such as physics, you have a set of methodologies to set up and run an experiment and analyze the outcome. Fields such as engineering also have processes in place to make sure a high quality outcome is realized. These processes are the reason that bridges generally do not suddenly collapse most of the time and that trains mostly run on time. So, what about computer science? Computer science also has processes that have evolved over the years. It's still a relatively young field, as opposed to a field like physics, on which scientists have worked for centuries already. One of the first widely used development processes in computer science is the waterfall model from 1970. This model follows the slightly naive assumption that there are five fixed consecutive steps in software development. We start with an analysis of requirements. What does the customer want? In the next step, the software is designed according to those requirements. In the third step, actual code is written. Then the software is tested by the engineers and the customer indicates whether the software adheres to the requirements that were defined in the first step. And finally, the software needs to be maintained after it has been shipped. One of the main problems with the waterfall model is that its steps are pretty rigid. Once a step is completed, there's no way to go back. This means that the waterfall model can't handle change very well. Since software is pretty complex, this is a big problem. Changes can occur because a client wants to do things differently during the project, the money can run out, you realize too late that parts of the design were not technically feasible. Basically, you're learning a lot while creating a software product and you need a process that allows you to incorporate what you learn into the product. In other words, you need to embrace change. In order to better deal with change, alternative development processes have evolved from the waterfall model. You can put them on a scale that indicates how well the methodology copes with change. The unified process model, also called UP or RUP, Rational Unified Process, is still pretty strict. More agile processes such as extreme programming and scrum leave more freedom to the team to adapt. And this is why agile processes have become the go-to approach for developing software. Computer science is still a young field, as I said earlier, so at some point there will probably be a successor to Agile that everybody flocks to. Even though UP is being used less by companies nowadays, it was still very popular for many years. Also, it introduced several standard components that can be adapted to a more Agile workflow. So it's a good foundation for learning about software development processes. I'm going to spend some time now to discuss the various phases it consists of and how these phases interact. The core idea of unified process is to develop software iteratively. You split up the huge task of creating a complete, very complex software project into smaller projects that can be completed in a reasonable amount of time and you establish at the beginning how much time each project is going to take. Each of these mini projects is called an iteration. An iteration stands on its own. It has its own milestones and it should result in a complete system that can be shown to clients that is tested and integrated into the whole product. So, an iteration is a usable subset of the final system and not just a prototype. An iteration tackles a specific set of requirements and extends the system. Or in some case, it may revisit the current software and improve it according to new insights or as a result of other changes. 
These changes actually happen pretty often. Stakeholders that use the software change their minds all the time. An end user may prefer a different feature set after trying out the project. The management team may decide that the company is going into a different direction, so their requirements change. Uh, software developers may discover a technical limitation that changes the design, and so on. This is why each iteration chooses a few requirements and then implements them. This way you get feedback quickly and you have an opportunity to use what you've learned to adapt the process. Adopting such a process can mean the difference between life and death of a company. Take Slack, for example. They started as a company that wanted to create a mass multiplayer role-playing game. In order to get the team to work together, they made an internal communication tool. By getting feedback from the people using it, the founders realized that such a tool would be useful for everyone. Hence, the company changed direction. They scrapped the multiplayer game idea and focused on their communication tool instead. Within a year, Slack was valued to over a billion dollars. Embrace change. UP defines four phases, inception, elaboration, construction, and transition. I'll discuss each of these phases now, but in the coming weeks, we'll focus primarily on the first two phases of UP. So overall, UP is about developing software iteratively and involving your users early on. Requirements are important, but can change in UP as opposed to in the waterfall model. UP advocates using visual modeling of software components using a language such as UML. There will be a separate video about that. And finally, you verify the quality of the software and release it at the end of each iteration. So let's start with the inception phase. The goal of inception is to determine what problem the software is going to solve, what the scope is of the software, the vision of what the software is going to be like, and an analysis of how the software fits into the business. Often a part of the inception step is a go-no-go -go decision on whether to continue with the project. Typically this phase lasts a few weeks maximum. In UP, you explicitly deliver outcomes of a phase. These are also called artifacts. Here's an overview of the expected artifacts for the inception phase. Realize that these documents are on a relatively high level. The vision document describes the whole project from a bird's eye point of view. Imagine a vision document that describes a system for submitting and grading lab assignments. A list of use cases then describes how the end users interact with the system. So, students should be able to submit assignments and see their grades. Teachers and teaching assistants should be able to view the assignments, distribute and grade them. Other artifacts are a project glossary, a business case, how do we make money over the back of these poor students, a risk assessment, a rough plan and perhaps some prototypes to test technology or ideas for the user interface. Inception is not about setting up a very precise project plan, but more about establishing a rough outline of the entire project without going into much detail. How long will it approximately take and how much does it cost? This is not the stage where you map all possible user interactions in detail. You're just trying to get an idea of who is going to use the system. Normally, you would include a few use cases, in particular the ones that describe the main functionalities of the software. Inception is not about deciding on icon colors, the margin used for buttons, and which specific libraries you use. It's about deciding what platforms the application is supposed to run on. Is it a mobile app, a website, uh, or embedded software in a TV set? And you need to think carefully about what the risks are of a project and the overall design decisions that you make. If you want to allow functionality where the customer can change the limit of their credit card in the system, you also need good protection so that criminals cannot abuse this. If you have a restaurant search website, you need to make sure that information about life-threatening allergies is correct 
otherwise you may endanger people's lives. Okay, so much about inception. Let's move on to the second phase, elaboration. You're still in the process of inventorying and designing, but you're going to start to add more detail in this phase. You need to establish the foundation of the architecture that your software is going to use. Think about which technical frameworks and third-party systems you will depend on. I'll talk more about architecture in a minute. You also create a prototype that already includes the main components of the foundation, so you can eliminate a lot of risks. Use the basic use cases from the inception phase to test whether your foundation is suitable. The elaboration phase also results in artifacts. You need to produce a use case model that describes in more detail how users will interact with the system. You may need to describe extra non-functional requirements. For example, you want the assignment submission system to work flawlessly even if tens of thousands of students are using it at the same time. Or you want to ensure that the system is online 99% of the time. Finally, the architecture of the software should be well defined at this point. But what do we mean by software architecture? It's a very popular term in software development. You can look it up in Wikipedia, but that doesn't necessarily clarify what it actually means. Larman also provides a definition of software architecture. It includes, in any case, an overview of the major elements of a software system. Next to that, a software architecture should describe how these major elements are related, what they do, and what they are responsible for. Responsibility is an important concept in software design. In the coming weeks, we'll talk more about responsibility of software components and what that means. Overall, software architecture should explain why a system is designed in a particular way and what the trade-offs are that led to this design. For example, an assignment submission may have a login design that requires students to use two-factor authentication. The reason for this is probably to avoid fraud. Another design decision could be that a submission can be associated with multiple students, because in the future we might want to add functionality that allows students to submit assignments in pairs of two. There, these are exactly the things that a software architecture document should describe. Since <coughs> elaboration is a continuation of inception, it iterates on a few documents such as risk analysis and the business case, both of which may be impacted by what we learned in the elaboration phase. Also, there will be a more detailed project plan that takes the insights from the phase into account. So, what does elaboration give us? We now have a more stable vision of what the software is supposed to be, what its architecture is composed of. We reduce the number of risks by building prototypes. And finally, we have a better grasp on how much time the project is going to take and what it will cost. Then, it's time to build the beast. Of course, this is important. But at this stage, we're not spending too much time on this topic. The main goal is to get a baseline product together here that has the main functionalities in there. Not all features have to be completed in the construction phase. But it should be possible to deploy the software so that users can try it and give feedback. The final phase of UP is transition. <coughs> the first version of the software is ready and we want to put it into the user's hands. This is the phase where you run beta tests, you train users, you make sure there's a plan to transition from the legacy system to your shiny new system. There may be some work to do here, like converting old data to a new format or directing users from old URLs to new ones and so on. You normally spend quite some time fixing bugs, making minor improvements based on the user feedback and finishing the remaining features. The goal is to make sure users can use the system, that everybody who's involved agrees that the product does what we want. 
and we spend some time on refining the software until we call it a day and product is finished. Here you see an overview of all the phases we discussed. Just like in a waterfall model, the main phases do not overlap in time. However, activities such as designing, implementing or testing are spread out over these phases and their focus changes depending on the phase that you're in. Business modeling and requirements analysis are mainly done in the inception and the elaboration phases. Implementation is mainly done in construction, but also in earlier phases focused on prototype implementation. Testing happens throughout the four processes. And deployment, making your system operational, plays a major role in the transition phase and a minor role in earlier phases, more aimed at deploying prototypes and getting user feedback. Here's a brief overview of these six different activities. In this course, we're mainly interested in the first three. Next to these main activities, there are a few, let's call them meta or supporting activities. This includes project management, change management, to make sure changes in the requirements or in involved stakeholders are dealt with properly, and managing tools to support the process, such as project management software, development environments, communication tools, and so on. We focus on the first three activities. The first is to understand current processes in a business. Who's involved in what? How does the organization work in general? Domain modeling is also a part of this activity. Requirements engineering establishes what a system should do and how to get that information from the customers on the one hand and the developers and designers on the other hand. Finally, analysis and design talks about how the system should be implemented, creating a foundation, a software architecture that allows you to build what the customer wants within the technical limitations. This concludes the video. I've tried to give an overview of classic development processes and I hope this gives you some insight into how software development processes have evolved. If you have any questions, post them in the Teams channel of this course. Thanks for watching and catch you in the next one.